Good evening from our headquarters in Kyiv. This is The Sunday Show at the Romatsk International, the only prime time TV program which is explaining Eastern European geopolitical storm in English. And I'm Natalia Humenyuk. And we have new season and new format where we are discussing the most important issues of the week. So that's what we have today. <music> The hottest topics of the week. Ukrainian parliament had voted for the new election commission. There are reasons to believe that the government parties have already the majority of votes. President Poroshenko addresses Ukrainian parliament. This year his appeal is identity, language and army. An activist in Odessa was shot and wounded. What does it mean? So um, that would be very political today. We have with us Svetlana Zalishuk, who is a member of par Ukrainian parliament and representing the bloc of Petro Poroshenko uh, and a former activist and still an activist within the parliament. Uh, so uh, I, I, I like to have the thanks that you're joining our, I would say, a bit informal discussion so the people outside of Ukraine would understand what's really uh, the most important issues. And uh, I think that uh, one is the one probably not the most mentioned outside is the new election commission. The parliament had voted and still uh, we have some independent candidates, but both two parties, uh, Petro Poroshenko bloc and Narodny Front, they are uh, having the majority of votes already. That's how we see. What would be your take? And also, Svetlana, I ask you to explain that you represent the bloc of Petro Poroshenko, but you're also known to be kind of a, an opposition within the uh, fraction. So first of all, good evening, and it's my pleasure to be here. So I'll start probably with my status. Indeed, I ran uh, to the parliament by the invitation of president, president of Ukraine, Petro Poroshenko. He invited us, me, my colleagues, Mustafana and Serhii Leshchenko, former journalist, to be in his list. But by Ukrainian legislation, you can still be an independent running on the national list of certain party. Later on, uh, being in the parliament already, we joined uh, a small party that was born before Euromaidan called Democratic Alliance. And indeed, you mentioned that uh, this party is critical towards uh, current government, in particular on sec central electoral committee issue. Uh, yeah. So let's go on that. Uh, let's explain to our audience uh, why it matters, uh, because the election commission, uh, their term had expired some time ago. We have elections next year, both presidential and parliament elections. And finally, we have this uh, now 15 people elected out 17. And uh, there are a lot of close allies of both the president and the leaders of the uh, Narodny Front, but as well there are people from uh, Timoshenko bloc. So how people should understand that? How do you read that? Let's start with the background. Central Electoral Commission played always a great role in any election campaign and elections. We have a proverb in Ukraine that wins not the one who gets the, most, the majority of the votes, but the one who counts the votes and it tells you, explains you what is behind this whole story of the uh, election of the members of the Central Electoral uh, Committee. Uh, and uh, yes, their uh, terms of current head of CEC and also members of CEC expired already four years ago, which is illegal. They are, uh, sir, they, uh, they are taking their posts basically illegal and there was a lot of uh, discussion in the society whether it will be at, at all legitimate uh, for them to conduct next elections or any elections basically in Ukraine. Why, for, for what reason Rada could not reappoint or elect new members? Because there was a big fight for the majority in this body. You've mentioned correctly that at the moment coalition, Blok Petra Poroshenko and Narodny Front has the majority and uh, the, their numbers were increased to 17. However, the quorum 
was not increased. And that's what allows them to keep their majority in this body. So they have eight people and the quorum is like... Uh, Eleven. Eleven. Block Petra Poroshenko has eight, but if you uh, count also others who are believed to be closed, allegedly close to the president, you'll get those 11 votes. Means that they can, uh, this is a quorum, so they can conduct any meeting of the CEC without having other representatives. But as well, for instance, some of the representatives of the civil society, especially the watchdogs, are very happy that Yevgen Radchenko, uh, who is representing the committee for... Um, Voters. of voters of Ukraine coming, so it brings a bit of the transparency. It was Samopomich, the only party which somehow dared to uh, name and the candidate which is not directly under the control of the party. So really, what are the... Still, you would say that there are the people close to Timoshenko, so the parties are really putting their people on the ground. Uh, are you really worried or really, you know, um, think that still we have the diversity? I think that's the main disappointment about the situation that after revolution, you know, and after building new institutions in Ukraine, everyone f was fighting or expected CEC to be an independent institution so that we can nominate those members that are not loyal to that or another political name, but loyal to certain principles. And Ivan Radchenko, by the way, he has that reputation in the society. He's from the civil society. He didn't work with any particular you know, political uh, body or so on. So this is the main disappointment. It's uh, that uh, it's, it did not become an independent institution called to guarantee that elections conducted in accordance with the law and international principles. The second point is still, uh, you know, probably our audience, we're coming to the election season, uh, is interesting to know what would happen with the election code. Because somehow there was a very happy moment a year ago when we knew that it, it was voted. But so far as I talk to the analysts, there are a lot of chances that it won't be voted or it would be changed in some of other aspects, uh, like, for instance, the uh, funding of the political parties. So also, what are the things to watch out? Probably the best way to check, to test the forecast would be to read in details the State Union of the President, his address uh, to the Parliament. And he has mentioned a single word. He didn't mention a single word about electoral code, unfortunately. He talked about many reforms, many problems in society, but not this one. And in my, uh, how I read it is that there is a very low chance for the new electoral code to be voted in the second reading. What we were all, you know, me in particular, uh, was promoted and uh, supported already for years and years, yet before the parliament. But would you really campaign for that? Because I talked previously to the different analysts and also the representatives of the civil society, and they said, like, we also counting. Should we really put a lot of effort to something which is probably is not even feasible? So it's like the fight is there, but people still uh, like deciding: should they really, really do if uh, like so much put a lot of energy if it looks like the uh, there are there won't be enough of the. Um, uh, votes in the parliament overall, that the you chances know, are not that high. Um, when the president came to the parliament, we number of people, like several dozens of parliamentarians, were in t-shirts, says open lists. And basically, this is was, it was their message or question to the pre president whether he is ready to adopt these new rules for the society to elect next members of the parliament, but also local authorities and the president himself. This is what the new electoral code is about. So, uh, as you know, we started this campaign for, for new electoral code, uh, well, approximately a year and a half ago, and we uh, um, announced this uh, so-called big political reform, which uh, includes electoral code and a corruption court, which is thankfully uh, adopted and also the um, decrease or restriction of the parliamentarian impunity. Uh, so you started, but still, you know, I think like in, in among our audience, there are a lot of like analysts, diplomats who looking and they're speaking about that. Uh, and in Ukraine, definitely you can still vote for the election code very close to the elections. Uh, and even after the presidential elections, uh, but it doesn't look so yeah, I, I agree with you completely. Uh, but at the same time, for example, if you look at the anti-corruption court, right? Remember, one year ago, president at the YES conference said, 
uh, he was asked about anti-corruption court and he said, look, they exist only in some African countries, third countries that don't have this democracy and so on. But later on, because of the pressure and also support of the civil society, some parliamentarians, international community, IMF, of course, we managed to adopt it. And it was the fact that President this time, this September, was, you know, was showing off that this is his result, his achievement. So what are the things to watch out? So far, I know that it's interesting to watch out for the uh, way the political parties are financed. And in particular, there is a kind of the change the uh, people encourage, for instance, that the, there would be transparency of the funding and the state would fund the political parties, but somehow it means that the, a lot of money would come to the political parties uh, and would be given to oligarchic media for the money uh, they are kind of buying the political ads. So somehow it's kind of a good idea that there would be the state money, not kind of unknown uh, money for the political parties, but it's really a lot. So I, as I understand, there is no really uh, will of the state really to fund political parties. Well, actually it is happening for the last year and a half state financing of the parties. We adopted this law two years ago and it was part of this legislation. Serhi Leshenko was the first author, me, Mustafa was also supporting it. So at the moment, all parties that are represented in the parliament, they are getting st state finances. And this is, I think, a great achievement because now those new parties, they want to run politics in a different way. They, it's not necessary for them uh, you know, to knock the door of some oligarchs or rich people. They have alternative resources to finance their activities. Also, connected to this uh, issue, you're right, we uh, created this the system of the monitoring of the finances of the parties. And at the moment, so far, if you monitor, we have already dozens of different investigations of how Batkivshina was financed, Svoboda was financed, uh, and some other parties. Uh, now, those cases are investigated when, for example, as it was, you know, as, as a journalist, you very well, you know very well, when, for example, some students, in accordance with the report, some students, hundreds of students supported financially that or another big party. Can you believe that? You can't, especially with hundreds of thousands, you know, of thousands I, of money. I, I remember this investigation where the lot of uh, pensioners finance Yulia Tymoshenko body. Uh, the second biggest, uh, probably, political uh, thing was this week the uh, address of Petro Poroshenko in the parliament, uh, which was a bit different from, I think, previous ones because uh, there were at first, 2014, about security. Later, it was about the reforms. Uh, now, it was a lot about the identity, about the language, army, and also the issues like receiving the autonomy from the um, for Ukrainian auto Ukrainian church. Yeah. So, uh, really, how you assess also, and uh, this is like the start of the campaign. So, what are you watching at this? Uh, what people should know about that? Well, unfortunately, I, I was looking at the president's address and uh, I saw the candidate for the presidency, not the president. He was using the floor in the parliament to campaign with his own, you know, agenda. But, but really, doesn't it happen with any incumbent? <laughs> You know, yes, it does. It, it, it is. But I think there are a number of the problems that presidents should uh, care still before the, the, the beginning of the presidential campaign as the president. And I think much more attention should have been uh, spent on explaining of how we're going to um, deal with the economic reforms, of how we're going to attract more direct investments, of how we can deal with the migration of millions of Ukrainians abroad so that Ukrainian enterprises can't really hire new people. Uh, but for instance, still, you being the uh, member of factions, though you um, say you're independent, for instance, uh, the issue is also the, the foreign audience is looking. Poroshenko definitely said that uh, no way for the land reform, meaning that the land, uh, there won't be market for, for land uh, uh, so far, at least prior to the elections. Um, so is it like the decision? So you think it, it really won't happen? You can read it that way? Well, what he said, and here I support the president, he said, we need land reform 
because it's in the best way will help our economy. But he said at the same time that I don't see a perspective for this parliament to vote on the land reform because number of the political forces in the parliament wouldn't give those votes, including number of the members of Bloc Petra Poroshenko. They just don't want to support it but, but because it's toxic in their eyes. But don't you think that if the president uh, says it this way, it means like, you know, I'm not encouraging anybody, so it's like, skip it. In a way, in a way, yes. He just admitted that he's not going to fight for it, he's not going to propose this agenda until the presidential election, at least. So for you, what was the most important thing uh, from what you've heard? Well, obviously, president is in charge of the security and foreign policy, and here uh, I would support a number of the things that president said about uh, giving, about care, taking care of the uni unity amongst our international partners to keep the sanctions, for example. Because there's, there, are the, there are already problems with the Hungarians and Italians that claimed yesterday that they will not uh, take the uh, prolongation of the sanctions just by granted and then want an open discussion about this issue. And I think it, you know, it's first alarms to us that uh, it's, it's going to be a very difficult uh, fight. Secondly, this is a new regime in Azov Sea. Uh, new uh, security uh, challenges, threats to our economy, trade, sea trade, you know, and also just security, physical security of the land, territorial integrity. Uh, third point is about North Stream 2. Obviously, this is another fight that we will uh, face during the next year. I think these are the main issues that were important for me. But they are um, more or less, it's they're very uh, con connected to the foreign policy yes. of Ukraine and of course Ukrainian relations with Russia, with the war with Russia. Uh, and by the way, there would be also, um, there is a need to prolong the uh, vote uh, regarding the uh, special, uh, it's not even the special status how it's uh, designed, but we're speaking about the, the law connected to the Donbass and the way the voting should happen there. And uh, uh, this October, uh, there would be, uh, it expires and should be prolonged in order the Minsk agreement uh, is kept. So really how you also as an MP are going to vote and what's we doing with that? Because it's also like the part of the Ukrainian obligations and everybody from the international community says that, you know, yes, of course, Russia doesn't really uh, keep to the promises, but uh, Ukraine doesn't, shouldn't give the pretext for, um, for, for Russia. Like Kurt Volker, for instance, also claimed that. And it wasn't really clearly mentioned, you know, like, it was not also very clearly mentioned in the parliament. You didn't hear that the president really encouraged the parliament to support it, though he had a chance. Yes. At the moment, there were a lot of negotiations and consultations. And this is what I see on different closed meetings, together with Kurt Walker when he was in the parliament meeting with parliamentarians, together with ambassadors, other international guests that are coming here. And of course, this discussion is about what's going to happen with the prolongation of that law and in general, the perspective also to deal with the war. What obligations international community is ready to take uh, in order to demand from Ukraine also prolongation of that law? Because I'd like to just underline, I don't believe that at current circumstances, adoption of that legislation will serve Ukrainian interests. I think it will undermine our possibility. What would it change? What would it change? Because that's what also Kurt Walker says, that, you know, for Ukraine it doesn't change much, but it doesn't give Russia pretext for um, not uh, keeping to their promises. I'm, I'm talking about the real realization, implementation yeah. of the legislation. What, uh, at the moment, the consultation is about voting on the law in order to prolong it mm. with certain reservations on when it can be implemented, you know. So basically we play a game that we vote on it, but we want guarantees that it will never be implemented in a way. Uh, because, once again, I underline, uh, implementation of the law at, in the current circumstances, would, uh, it will be uh, to, to solve Ukrainian, to close the eyes at Ukra on Ukrainian wars at Russian, at Ukrainian expense and at Russian conditions, at Putin conditions, basically. So, you're right, I agree here with Kult Workle. We, at, at the moment, Ukraine should prolong it because otherwise it will give this food for Russians, you know, to create their narrative. And they are more successful, maybe. They are more efficient with this narrative 
talking to our international partners. And of course, uh, Svetlana, because uh, we are coming to the, especially like also after the YES conference, because people were looking closely to what the president candidates were saying, were saying you were also there. And still this week it was a discuss what are, and uh, coming to the new season, what are the new political forces and new generation, as you sometimes are uh, named, is going to do during these elections. And... Of course, I know a bit uh, that, you know, there is no clear decision, but there was today that your colleague Mustafa had uh, written then uh, somehow that he spent the summer silent, but it's time to go back. A lot of work needs to be done. By now we have enough energy understanding to shift into action. Next week we're starting to work on a team and an office. What does it mean? Well, what I can uh, comment now that Mustafa announced some hard work him, us, me, definitely with him, some other colleagues from the parliament, from the civil society, from business, that we want to work towards the goals to ensure that people will have more control over their country and more responsibility on what's going on. Is it a new party <laughs> or anything? I'll, I'll keep it to the comment I, I, I gave that uh, I can't uh, basically, uh, you know, reveal anything at the moment uh, because it wouldn't be fair towards other members that we didn't communicate it with. But once again, this announcement is uh, is uh, right, and uh, what he announced is uh, is real work uh, in order to build a team and to go to the regions to work with people to encourage them to take more power in their hands. Uh, by the way, what is always uh, interesting, especially about new political forces, what is the ideology of this group of political people? You know, are you again united against corruption? But, it, you know, corruption fight also is something the populists are um, kind of taking as their slogan as well. And, you know, for all good, it's everybody is for everything good. But uh, what is the coherent policy? Just, like, give us a hint. Well... First of all, corruption is not anti-corruption is not an ideology, obviously. However, it's very important part of our uh, whole uh, program or agenda, if you want, uh, in different spheres: in energy sphere, in basically building the institutions, in uh, party finances, in building the anti-corruption institutions, and so on and so forth. But uh, when it comes to ideology, I think we are the core of our people are liberal. But we have also some conservative representatives uh, and it's a good mixture of liberal and conservatives in our group. We'll definitely have more questions when we clearly know what you are up to. And then I think like uh, there would be different, also more political questions. But this time we're having kind of a roundup of this week. And, and yes, yeah, so we discussed the uh, Central Election Commission. We discussed the president address to the parliament and, you know, this kind of where people looking what's happening to the uh, younger youngsters at the parliament. Uh, the end of the week had been unfortunate with the new striking news about shooting in Odessa and an activist of the group of the um, People's Power um, uh, Oleh Mikhailik had been shot and wounded. He had been in critical uh, position, uh, condition, you know, uh, it was serious, but now I know he's conscious. Still, it's very, very uh, tough situation and it's shooting. It's not just a physical attack. So, you know, I know you knew uh, Oleh and really what it also, uh, and that is not the first attack on the activist in Ukraine within this summer, how we should read that. During the last year and a couple of months, it's already 14th attack on a civil society activist. And previously in summer, we were also uh, working with a representative of Automaidan, you know, the group that was very active during Euromaidan, uh, and also another civil society organization like Vitaly Ustemenko and Serhii Sternenko. And uh, we, were, we wrote an appeal to, even to the Secretary of the Council on National Security and Defense to conduct a separate meeting of this council on the situation in Odessa. Because we believe this is not just attack, not a coincidental, coincidental attack on a number of different civil society activists. We believe it's a real strengthening of the power supported by the criminals that has deep and old roots in Russia. Basically, the mayor of Odessa, Truhanov, 
who has a big popularity. Uh, he himself allegedly has a Russian passport. It was investigated and yes, supported it was too much by the investigation. We actually proven yeah. that this passport That's is right. existing. Yeah. That's right. And uh, yes, exactly. And uh, he is also, uh, as you know, supported by some Russian uh, connections. And the point is that all these people that have been attacked, they somehow were investigated the corruption in the city, investigating the building and all this, you know, very expensive uh, new infrastructure that are being built that connect connected to uh, mayor uh, of Odessa. We also know that uh, it's visible that administration of the president supports mayor. You could judge it from the recent visit of his uh, of president's wife when she spent some time with the mayor of Odessa doing some cultural uh, things, and it was already having background of these attacks on, on on the activists. But the most important thing that you know, by having this kind of a deal that uh, we just close eyes on what's going on with the situation in the, uh, with the civil uh, activists. And in, in return, we get the guarantee during the presidential elections or parliamentary elections from the authority in Odessa. I think there is a risk to lose Odessa as a region because it's a strategic region. You know very well that uh, when war started, Odessa was one of those regions that were, uh, were considered to become part of Russia, Novorossiya. I would also encourage also our audience to uh, look to uh, follow our reports on what's going on because of course these activists are not that uh, famous also internationally but because it's already one by one another attack and sometimes it's 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 indeed very difficult because you know like uh, not every activist is an activist not every attack is really a political attack but in this case we clearly know it is um, and another story which we'd like to follow up uh, so it's not going out of the radar is a story connected to the uh, investigative journalists Natalia Sidletska and Kristina Berdinsky yes. who have uh, been forced a, a bit earlier uh, to uh, provide the data from their, their cell phones uh, because of the uh, case regarding the uh, National Anti-Corruption Bureau and possible leak to the uh, journalists. So uh, journalists went to the court and we had a pretty good news from the European court uh, that um, uh, the government has to for the general prosecutor office has at least for one month uh, to stop uh, any kind of action so uh, still there would be some procedure what are you gonna to do what the parliamentaries can do about this case because this is the real attack on the it's not about this two in famous journalists, but it's about the uh, protection of the sources of the journalists in I Ukraine. absolutely agree with you. And I think, first of all, it's important to stand up and to have a public position. Because I don't think, when I look at the political scene, not so many politicians stood up and said, this is not right, it's not wanna, what, what should happen. Uh, second of all, I, me, number of other parliamentarians, he basically Mustafa, Hanna Hopko, Lena Sotnik, I probably I won't mention everyone, but we wrote an appeal to general prosecutor and we met him personally. We demanded the meeting with him. This is where I, we've got the news that uh, they are following not only Natalia Sedlaitska but Kristina Berdinsky. I wrote it also on Facebook after we finished that meeting. And we uh, delivered our position that this is violation of journalist rights, of our international con uh, conventions as well. Any follow-up? So what are the next steps? You know, what we're expecting and uh, what still could be done? At the moment, it's in the hands of the courts. And uh, I congratulate the European Court for Human Rights who suspended the decision of the general prosecutor. And I remember general prosecutor, like uh, a year ago, gave his an interview, I don't know whether you've uh, seen it, where he said that uh, if prosecutor made a decision which would violate the decision of European Courts of Human Rights, he should be fired, or she, he or she should be fired. So it's very interesting to look what he's going to do now, when the European Courts of Human Rights basically banned the decision that General Prosecutor himself personally took against independent journalists. Well, it's very clear, this is the fight between anti-corruption institutions, and General Prosecution is trying to attack the head of Anti-Corruption Bureau. Mm -hmm. It's obvious. And journalists, basically, the hostages 
in this situation. It shouldn't be like that, for sure. I, for instance, would give an example because Kristina Berdinsky, she was at the YES conference and she said, like, she talked to a lot of politicians, yeah. uh, foreign, uh, Ukrainian, and said, like, you know, so now are you talking to me and do you trust any talk to uh, myself? Because now, you know, my phone could be you know, anything we talk now could be somehow um, given to the uh, law enforcement. Svetlana, thanks a lot for the discussion because it's uh, like a bit, we're trying with the new formats that uh, I think with this, with, within this half an hour we kind of uh, rounded up uh, what was on the uh, political agenda in Ukraine today. It's not always about Ukraine, but this week was heavy about the politics and parliament. We also, I would ensure, invite here and will invite within the new season the representative of different different political forces, including those who are supporting the president from Yulia Tymoshenko bloc and other, other political parties. Uh, but uh, this uh, Sunday show was together with uh, Svetlana Zelishuk. But I would like also to um, uh, draw attention to another case. You can find it on our webpage en.romatske.ua because our journalists traveled to Western Ukraine where they found out that uh, Vitaly Pivovarnik, Vyacheslav Pivovarnik, sorry, this is the man who had been accused by Ukrainian security uh, service uh, for plotting the murder of uh, the uh, Russian journalist Babchenka, an incredibly important case, uh, that this guy had been at his hometown of Chop just early September. He, despite everything, he was there. We managed to talk to his father, to his uh, uh, neighbors, and you know, he is he is named to be connected to Putin himself and in order the uh, murder of uh, numerous people. And yes, he was there and you can watch this report and find out more. Uh, with that, I say goodbye and also um, would encourage you to um, subscribe for our new uh, newsletter, uh, a weekly roundup of the events. Uh, you can find the uh, where to subscribe for that at the Hromatske uh, webpage en.hromatske.ua as well. Go to our Twitter and Facebook Facebook, uh, Serge Romansky International, we are there and we are following all of the events and see you next week.